Okay, I'll briefly introduce the cloud-based recommend system. And for close uh, cloud-based recommend system of personal device, uh, connect uh, personal data, including uh, personal attribute information and uh, user item interaction data, and then upload this personal data to the cloud server. And cloud server then uh, store this personal data and uh, then train a powerful recommend system on this data. Once the recommended model is trained, and when the recommended system receive a user query or a user request, it will automatically generate a top key recommendation and then send the top key recommendation back to the personal device. And then the personal device will display the recommendation result. This is a pipeline for the cloud-based recommended system. So as you can see, for the cloud-based recommend system and the cloud server, it store user data and train the machine learning model and the machine learning train the recommendation model and the recommendation model are also deployed on the cloud server. And for the personal device, uh, it's just uh, connect user data and uh, upload the data to the server and uh, display recommendation result. So this is uh, the traditional cloud-based recommend system. Actually more than 99% of recommend system are cloud-based. Yeah, uh, so there is a question. Uh, is the, the optimal recommended paradigm and uh, what can go wrong here? Uh, actually, for the cloud-based recommended system, there are three major concerns. The first one is about user privacy. And in Australia, uh, 892 reported data breaches in last year uh, with 35% of affecting more than 100 users and 64% uh, coming from retail, health, and uh, financing services. All of these uh, apps and the website adopt recommendation systems. So this is the first one. It's about user privacy, about the data security, whether our data are safe or not. The second concern uh, is about the robustness, whether the recommended system are robust enough. And actually cloud-based recommended system heavily depend on the quality wireless connection. If you don't have the wireless connection, you cannot use recommendation service. This is the traditional uh, recommended system. But however, quality wireless connection is not always available, especially in some remote area. But as we know, the beautiful point of interest, the beautiful forest or attractions are located in remote area. That's where we really near the recommended system, but where we cannot get the recommended service because there we don't have the quality wireless connection. This is the second problem of cloud-based recommended system. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, this example is from Australia. Uh, Optus, Optus actually is uh, essentially the number one Australian mobile service provider. Even for the number one mobile service provider, it can only have 70% 3D geographic coverage. And the number drop to 60% in remote area where all the POI and the great campus are formed. As you know, in the remote area, the coverage is only 60. In other words, uh, for example, if there are 100 uh, places in the remote area, only 60 in almost uh, only 60 places, the uh, various connections are available. But for the other 40, you don't have the various connection. In other words, you cannot use cloud-based recognition system. This is the second uh, problem with cloud-based recognition. Its robustness is not enough. <clears throat> Another problem is 
the energy footprint, energy cost, and uh, the heavy computer resource cost. As we know, uh, for the cloud-based uh, recommend system, we need uh, the cloud server to store user data to train the powerful recognition model. All this based on very powerful uh, computer resources. And of course, it leads to very uh, high uh, energy cost. Uh, there is a report, uh, Information and Communication Technology, ACT, is predicted to use 21% of the global electricity. So where the data center account for uh, one of the third. So as you can see, there are at least three concerns about the cloud-based recommend system. So here, uh, I show a short summary about the downside uh, of the cloud-based recommend system. Uh, it's about the privacy issue and uh, the robustness. Uh, and the third one is about the huge computation resources cost and the energy footprint. So in order to address this problem, a uh, new uh, recommendation paradigm called on-device recommend system emerged in the recent several years. And for this new uh, recommendation paradigm, we offload some computation tasks from the cloud to the device. <clears throat> Actually, I, you can say uh, for the traditional cloud-based recommend system, uh, the personal device only collect user data and the display recommend result. But for the on-device recommend system, we change the game. We move part of computation or even all the computation from the cloud to the decentralized device. So uh, we can uh, move the for example, we can move the model training part. We can also move the model deploy part for our devices. So in this new paradigm, first, we don't need to consider, or we don't need to worry about our privacy because you don't need to upload your data to the cloud server. You don't need to upload your query uh, onto the server because the model are deployed, the model are installed in your own mobile device. So we don't need to worry about user privacy anymore. This, uh, secondly, uh, as the recognition system are just installed on your own device, even without the wireless connection, you can still enjoy the recognition service. We don't rely on the cloud. And the third, because we move part or even all the computation tasks from the cloud to the decentralized mobile devices. So the tasks on the cloud server become very light. So we can significantly reduce the energy footprint. Uh, even our central server don't need to be so powerful, don't need to be equipped with so many GPU clusters. As you can see, uh, the on-device on recommend, uh, on recommend system are very promising to address uh, the three concerns, the three problem. And as a new recommendation paradigm, on-device recommendation system offer great promise. The first one, we don't need to transmit data elsewhere for analysis, so it's more private. And the second, a recommender is on board to generate results. It can provide instant recognition. We don't need to worry about the communication delay because there is no communication between your device and the cloud. The third <coughs> is <coughs> on-device recommendation uh, very resource efficient. And on-device recommendation is not a fairy tale in academic. Actually, uh, this new uh, recommendation paradigm has been widely adopted in industry. Uh, for example, uh, Quetro. Uh, actually, Quetro uh, adopted the on-device recommendation, uh, on recommendation system for their short video recommendation. And uh, Google also adopted uh, the on-device recommendation. Uh, their product is called the TensorFlow Net Recommendation. And the uh, Topo also adopted on-device recommendation system, for example, the Edge Rec system. And the, the Brave Brother, 
uh, it's a new browser. Uh, they also adopt on device recognition system. Uh, for example, the news recognition uh, use uh, federated learning. So uh, in this tutorial, we will cover uh, three technical parts of uh, on device recognition system. The first part is about the model deployment and the model inference. Uh, actually, in this part, we focus on model deployment and uh, model inference. Uh, in this part, we still assume uh, the recognition model is trained in the cloud, but we deploy it onto the device and then perform efficient model inference on device. So this part focus on model deployment and the model inference on device, but we don't care about the model training. This is the first part. In the second part, we mainly focus on the model training and the model updating. In other words, this part, in this part, we will talk about how to train a recognition model on decentralized devices. The third one is about the security and the privacy of on-device recommendation system. Uh, the security is mainly uh, refer to the poisoning attack. And the privacy here mainly refers to, uh, refer to the privacy attack. In this part, we will uh, talk about the security issue and the privacy issue and the how to <coughs> address uh, this issue in uh, on device recommendation system architecture. So now let's unfold the call with this new recommendation paradigm. Here, uh, which, uh, this figure illustrates uh, these three parts, deployment and the inference. As you can see, uh, in this part, the model training still finish on the cloud server. Uh, the second part is about the training and up updating. As you can see, we move the model training to the mobile device. Uh, the last part is about the security and the privacy. Uh, we need to consider even on the device, uh, because when we uh, train a uh, recognition model in a collaborative way, because as we know in a single device, user data is very, very sparse. Only with, within one single device, we cannot train a powerful model. We cannot train a good recognition model. We have to collaborate with other users. We have to collaborate with other devices. So when you collaborate with other devices, how to collaborate? Do we need to share our data? Do we need to share our model parameter? So when we collaborate with others, we have to communicate with other devices. So when we collaborate with others, the privacy problem appears. <clears throat> so uh, in this tutorial, we will uh, cover this main three topic deployment and the inference model training and updating on device and the security and the privacy issue of on device recommendation system. So uh, in the next part, uh, Dr. Chen will introduce the definition of the taxonomy on device recommendation system, uh, the deployment and the inference of on device recommendation system. I will hand it to Dr. Tungchen. Yeah, um... Thanks very much uh, for Professor Ng's introduction and all the background information. <clears throat> so um, I'm Tong Chen from the University of Queensland. You can also call me Rocky. Um, so firstly, apologize for all the technical glitches uh, that has happened at the very beginning of today's tutorial. We had to you know, go back and forth to call all the technicians to come and help us solve the problem. So apologies for the delay. Um, and I will try to speed things up a little so we can finish the first half of today's tutorial on time. So now um, let's try to start with the foundations. Okay, start with all the basics about what is recommendation. So, okay, um, we'll start with the very uh, traditional and basic setting of recommendation tasks. So basically, if we view a recommendation model as a system, you put something into it and you get something as an outcome, right? So what you put in, Okay, the minimal requirement would be a data set recording the interactions between users 
So we use U to represent users and then items, okay? So the items are represented as V, okay? And basically what you need is the interactions between users and items. And then as the outcome or the output of all the training process with the, this data set you have provided, we ultimately want a pairwise similarity function. So F, U, and V here. Um, basically, we want this similarity function to be trained to capture the affinity between each user and item pair, okay? And actually, there has been many multiple ways you can use to possibly parameterize this very important similarity function. And some examples are just given here. Basically, you can choose to resort to the very classic matrix vectorization uh, proposed by Corin back in the 2009. Or if you have a lot of different features available in your data set, you can also think of using the vectorization machines, which are very good for modeling feature interactions. So that is from 2011. And as we enter the neural computing era, um, actually, recommender assistants also had huge benefits by adopting a lot of neural models. So you can consider using the deep learning version of those classic models, for example, the neural collaborator theory, the new IMF, and also the neural factorization machines, the NFM. And more recently, um, we actually have evidence, you know, the great success of graph neural networks. They are very, very strong in modeling graph structured data, and that is no exception for modeling user item interactions because they naturally form some bipartite graphs. So using graph neural networks like the very successful like GCN, that can be a very, very good choice for formulating this similarity function for your recommendation system. And yeah, of course, there are definitely many more other options for you to choose from, but actually this is not our core focus today. So we'll keep moving. Um, and still I am sticking with the traditional recommendation setting. Now we talk more about the model choice and optimization objective, okay? So there are many uh, different task formulations actually when it comes to recommender systems. Um, you can definitely do uh, the classic one, the top K recommendation. What we want is basically for each user U, what we want is to find the K unvisited items with the highest similarity score. So generated by this train, the similarity function. And basically for this purpose, we uh, mostly adopted this Bayesian personalized the ranking loss, the BPR loss. If you know you have some positive interactions with items, you uh, this V plus, and also you have observations on the negative items, okay, the V minus. What we ultimately want with this BPR loss is we would like to have the scores towards the positive item to be always a bit higher than the negative item scores. So this is uh, basically what BPR means as a loss function. And also, uh, we can define some click through rate predictions. Okay, so by the word meaning the click through rate, basically the task um, is asking us to predict whether this user U is going to click into this item link V. Okay, for example, it's an advertisement for some products kind of things. So essentially, that becomes a binary classification task. So the model is expected to output the probability, you usually zero or one, yes or no, click or non-click. Because this is binary classification, we usually use the log likelihood loss, all right? So this is essentially the cross entropy, but written in the binary form. So that's basically it. And then we can also relax this binary classification setting a little and um, extend the output space into a continuous space essentially just a range. And then what we can do is to predict the rating score that a user gives to some items, okay? If we are dealing with the Amazon data set, basically we predict within the range between zero and five to reflect the real world ratings. Um, and because this is essentially uh, the regression has a more adopted loss function for this one is just the squared loss. And we do have some specific focus for the task we apply the own device recommender systems on today. 
So most of our focus today would be the top K setting. We will talk a little bit about the click through rate prediction and actually some very great models are actually proposed for this task. But for rating prediction, because you know, this is a more specific version of the previous two tasks, so we will pay less attention to the rating prediction task for today uh, when elaborating on our core ideas. So um, as we finish the classic recommendation setting and task definition, let me simply give a quick definition on you know, what is going to happen when we move recommendation under the on device settings, okay? Because it is you know, essentially still doing the recommendation task, right? So all the accuracy requirements will stay. So all the formulation will still follow the previous one I have just showed you uh, in uh, the slide earlier. However, because we are moving from cloud to the device, right? Naturally, we want the recommendation model to meet some additional on-device requirements. So if we summarize this thing in an informal way, right? We will have some very, very important questions to ask uh, when we do the on-device recommendation. So about deployment and inference, uh, because we don't necessarily care about on-device training, right? In order to make something work, in a very resource restrained um, computation environment, we will definitely need to care about the parameter size, right? So we are wondering, can this model fit in small memories, right? If only if this can fit in the small memory, then you can try to do all the downstream tasks to do all the predictions. And also the inference time, right? Because you don't necessarily have enough computation power compared with the cloud server. So uh, the evaluation time, the inference time of the deployed model also matters when you're talking about the own device setting. Uh, and also the training and updating, right? This is where the real-time own device training is needed. Then there is a need to call some attention to the training efficiency, right? You may wonder, will training this function consume much energy? Right? If you want to save energy in terms of training, Definitely, you want to save the time you need for training, right? So there comes the efficiency factor. And the communication overhead, that's very important as well, because in a lot of decentralized or on-device recommendation paradigms, there are some settings that we will need to have the model on each device to communicate with each other in order to enhance the final accuracy you can get. And then there comes to the frequency of information share and exchange, right? Because if you do that too frequently, you're introducing a huge communication overhead and that will actually harm the training efficiency as a byproduct. Um, and then when we are extending this paradigm and further consider the security and privacy aspects, and there are some other important things, uh, and additional goals for us to achieve. So sometimes the model privacy is a very important topic to talk about. For example, if we are resorting to federated learning as our solution, right, we will necessarily think about, okay, is the shareable information, for example, the model weights, right? Because we don't necessarily share the sensitive user data. However, some other, information shared, like the weights, can still be sensitive, can still reveal some very important information, right? So we will need to ensure that doesn't happen all the time. And for uh, this is more about passive privacy protection, right? So what if there are some attackers or malicious users, you know, joining the system as a part of, you know, their users and try to perform some adversarial attack on the system or on someone's privacy, then we will need to talk about the robustness of this function to adversarial attacks. So these are all important factors to uncover, uncover and um, do more research on when we want to extend the traditional cloud-based setting to on-device setting. And <clears throat> here, um, I will use a few more minutes to quickly go through the taxonomy we have defined 
in terms of these three big pillars of on-device recommender systems. So actually we do have a full version, so more comprehensive ones um, reviewed in our comprehensive survey on on-device recommender systems. So if you are not sure about what each of these acronyms mean, please feel free to refer to our uh, full survey. And for deployment and inference, uh, I will simply go through these five different subcategories with you so you don't get too surprised when I mention those names later, okay? So we do have binary code-based method, and we will talk about embedding sparsification method. And then we will talk about variable size embedding and compositional embedding methods. And at last, I will briefly touch upon how can we do deployment in a sustainable way, okay? Because we don't necessarily want this to be a one-off process. So on-device models can also have the opportunity to get updated, to adapt to data drifts or user interest changes, et cetera, et cetera. And then when we were talking about training and updating, main big sections, okay? So a main part, which is actually a very popular architecture for on-device recommendation, the federated recommendation methods, right? This is something you can never bypass when you talk about on-device recommendation. And then we will talk about a much different paradigm. It's the decentralized recommendation methods. When we say decentralized, it's more like the fully decentralized one because in federated recommendation, we always need to have the central server in place as the coordinator to coordinate the training of all the different agents. That's the case. But for decentralized recommendation methods, the engagement of the central server is further minimized. So some are fully decentralized, which doesn't necessarily require the existence of the central server at all. And some actually uh, have reduced the amount of times that a central server need to engage into the training process. So the use of the server will become minimal when we do decentralized recommendation methods. And then there are some own device fine tuning methods as well, because remember this part is all about training and updating. Okay. Then we talk about security and privacy, okay? And for this part, two main research problems will be discussed. The first one is about the privacy risks. So once you have discovered some privacy loopholes, okay, how can you possibly uh, fix all those issues? And then we have some active attacks that might happen when you become one of the users of the own device recommender systems. So if, you know, there are some, for example, poisoning attacks, which is a very, you know, common type of attack people see for recommender systems, how can we possibly protect our own device recommender from those attacks? So again, if you are interested uh, in knowing more details about all these taxonomies, please feel free to always refer to our comprehensive survey on own device recommender system. Okay. <clears throat> So that's all about the definition and the taxonomy. Um, that is more like the, you know, entry and appetizer before the main course comes, right? So now we will be entering chapter three, uh, that is about deployment and inference. So all the following three chapters, these are the main technical chapters. So here comes the main course of today's tutorial. So let's, you know, try to do a quick recap on this figure that you know Hong Zhi just showed us all, right? This is how the ideal, you know, decentralized recommender system should look like, right? We are introducing more computing roles to the devices, right? To users' personal devices. And we want to deploy some models locally in order to you know, offload all the computation from the cloud to the device. And with this one, a key question to ask is, you know, what can be the most important part, right? So what ensures this to happen? So basically, uh, I think many of you have realized what will be the key component for this one, right? So it's just sitting here right in the middle. It is the lightweight recommender that will make the difference here for on-device deployment and inference. 
So the key is to build a lightly parameterized recommender because if something is lightly parameterized, it can fit into the very restrictive memory constraints, right? And the computing space of uh, the small personal devices, and then you will be able to do subsequent tasks like recommendation. And in our comprehensive survey and research uh, and our um, own work over the past few years, we have drawn this conclusion right here. That is almost all the existing studies on developing this lightly parameterized recommender systems are around embeddings, okay? So embeddings, uh, that is a fairly you know, magical word for a lot of computer science areas, and that is no exception for recommender systems. Um, because we are not assuming every one of us sitting here today is having the background of recommender systems. So we will try to talk about more details when it comes to embeddings, okay? So we will try to answer these three important questions one by one in this main chapter. So firstly, what are embeddings, right? Especially in the context of recommender system. And why do embeddings matter when we want to do on-device recommendations? And then the third question is, if they do matter, right? How can we achieve lightweight embeddings in the context of on-device recommender systems? So this will be the very important questions to get answered. So let's try to answer all these important questions one by one. So first thing is, what are embeddings, right? So let me try to simplify things a little and just put embeddings into the context of recommender systems. So basically in recommender systems, embeddings are just this RD vector. So a D-dimensional vector defined in the real value the space. And that will be used you know, as the representation of entities. Okay, I'm using the entities here, but in order to clarify that a little bit further, let me define two scenarios. Okay, scenario one, we just are doing ID based recommendation. So basically in the data, in the record, you will only see user with some IDs and item with some IDs, they have interactions. So you don't have anything further. You don't have any features that describe the users and the items, okay? Then the entities will simply be those IDs of users or just the, ID, uh, the users and the items. <clears throat> and then if you are lucky, you can get your hands onto some feature rich data sets. You can essentially do this feature-based recommendation and the click-through rate prediction is a very typical example of feature-based recommendation. So in this case, entities, will essentially become the features that describe the users and items. So if we talk about users, it can be a user's age group, the region, the country, uh, and the occupation kind of things, et cetera, et cetera. And for this one, those features are usually paired with the IDs of users and items uh, because you know having the exact IDs usually enhances the overall recommendation accuracy. So we can basically see the feature-based recommendation is a kind of setting that underscores this one, right? So the most uh, common thing we will see is the users and items, and each user and each item uh, will have uh, the, their own embedding vectors. So we will talk mainly about this kind of scenario when we make any examples later on. Um, actually, here is just one example I'm going to make, right? Um, suppose we just have three items and two users in the entire data set. We can somehow learn their vector embeddings, right? And this is how they will possibly look like in the embedding space. So because, you know, each of the vectors can be essentially viewed as a specific point in this D-dimensional space, then it becomes fairly intuitive and easy for us to identify their similarities, right? For example, the MacBook Pro's distance with this user, Amy. This can be easily done quite efficiently using a lot of well-defined distance metrics, right? Like the cosine similarity, the dot, these are uh, pretty interchangeable. 
and then the Euclidean distance. So uh, they all can be used for quantifying similarities. And because as we have already concluded, the embeddings are the main parameter source of recommender systems, okay? So in a parameterized recommendation function, the main parameter consumption always come from those embeddings or the embedding layers or the embedding matrices, whatever you call them. So let's see why is that the case, right? Let's try to motivate the you know, research on the embedding layers a little bit further. So if you know, we are only doing representations for items, so here we just neglect the users here for now. So how many digits you will possibly need for representing all those n items embeddings? Well, it's just simple math, right? So it's just n times d and D is just the embedding dimension. So these will be the number of digits you need for this entire embedding layer. And see, let's see how that actually translates into the real parameter consumption or the proportion of the parameter consumption uh, in some well-defined recommendation models. So here is a toy example that we used to do uh, in our uh, the web conference 2020 paper. In this one, we are simply doing a sequential recommendation. So one extra context is that in sequential recommendation, we don't actually model the user embeddings. So only item embeddings are modeled. And here is one quick example using 10,000 items with dimension of 128. So this is the amount of digits you will need for item embeddings. And this part on the right hand side are all other model parameters. So if you simply account for the percentage, right, you will quickly notice that the item embeddings actually acquires the heaviest part of this entire model. And that's just for 10,000 items. So this is actually not even close to the industry scale because in real life, the industries are dealing with billion scale item sets. And there are many, many examples from many uh, industry companies like the Pinterest and Alibaba. And we see from you know, all these references, they are already dealing with those billion scale item sets from 2018. So that's way earlier. So that's around six years ago. And let's try to do another round of computation. Uh, as a follow-up example, okay? So let's suppose we have 10 million items. So it is not even billion scale. It's just 1% of a billion with this same dimension. And then we will have this amount of digits. And if we do some quick conversions, that's going to translate into five gigabytes in a 32-bit polling point system. Okay, so that's five gigabytes doesn't sound necessarily a lot uh, when we talk about modern computers supported by GPUs, right? But uh, recall, we are actually dealing with the on-device setting. So that will essentially mean if you have this five gigabytes to represent all the items, that will also go into whatever mobile app you are developing. So imagine you see a shopping mobile app with five to 10 gigabytes inside. That is quite scary, right? And that doesn't only occupy your disk space because they will also need to be loaded into your RAM in order to facilitate all the computation and the similarity calculation. So they will take uh, space in your memory as well. So that is pretty uh, impractical if we talk about on-device deployment and inference. So we have addressed what are embeddings and why embedding matters in this context. And let's try to discover what are all the possible remedies, right? So uh, I think one of the most straightforward way of thinking is with all of those, uh, you know, single mass calculation kind of things, we have kind of realized Right, the problem comes from we are using real valued vectors for each of the users and items in the data set. So can we possibly, you know, instead of using real valued entries in the embeddings, we just resort to the binary codes, right? Can we turn all these into binary codes? 
Of course, the answer is yes, it is definitely possible and feasible. So basically, if we want to do this, we will also need you know, some binary codes of dimension D, but this time, each dimension can only take you know, the binary option of two values, usually minus or positive ones. Um, and then this is usually done by you know, shrinking some embeddings learned from the continuous space using the sign function into this Hamming space. Okay, so basically doing some rounding based on the sign of each continuous entry in the original embedding. And this one has some good results we are all chasing after, right? Because a, a binary code with the length of D, it can represent up to two to the power of D minus one users or item, theoretically, if we do everything right, right? And simply if we set D to 32, that can be good for representing as many as 4 billion items and users. So this is pretty ideal, right? In terms of saving the memory and saving the storage. And because we are doing binary codes, so this also supports the fast similarity evaluation because we can simply use the logical operators and they can have very compact Boolean storage for each entry. We, don't, we no longer need to claim you know, the floating point numbers for each of the entries. Uh, this is another side benefit we can get from the binary code. And here are some very representative solutions in this space. Uh, one of them is called this uh, discrete collaborative filtering. Basically, for this one, it's bearing the same intuition. So we need to learn the continuous vector representations first and then use the side function to do some uh, rounding. But for this one, it's adding some additional learning objectives and constraints to make the learned binary codes more representative. So basically they come from these two additional formulations. So this one, uh, because they are using the O1 vector, so after this constraint, they are trying to have uh, an equal amount of uh, positive and negative in the learned binary code. So they call that a balanced partition. So after balancing, you will get something like this. So that they have you know, been able to distribute more evenly on the Hamming space. Uh, and then with this incorporation of the identity matrix, uh, they are doing a kind of decorrelation step. Okay, so basically if two codes, they don't represent the same user or item, yeah, they will be separated in this Hamming space. And this one uh, does result in some very good properties uh, because you will get less squashing. Okay, squashing usually, you know, some turns in hashing. Uh, it means you know different users, items, different inputs are hashed to the same location, and you will face less of this issue in DCF. And then the binary codes will be mu more mutually discriminated with all the additional constraints added. And then, because you know, as I say, the graph neural networks uh, is a very powerful model for learning uh, vector representations in continuous space. And that also has motivated some research in learning binary codes with GNN. So this is a very interesting and inspiring work as well, the hash GNN. And basically they are doing things a little bit differently compared with DCF because they use end-to-end -end training. And that is facilitated by this straight through estimator, so STE. So basically copying you know, the loss calculated from the last layer back to the place where your gradient has been stopped. And they can still do back end-to-end uh, -end, um, back propagation. And there are two joint losses proposed by the authors. So the first one is you know, uh, to reconstruct the observed interactions within the graph. So they are leveraging the nice properties and the connectivities observable uh, in the user item interaction graph. And also they are trying to incorporate this BPR loss with negative sampling. So a bit of enhancement to only use one of the two losses. 
And another thing is they have introduced some gating between the real valued and the binary representations throughout the learning process. So this queue actually will gradually decrease when doing the training. So eventually it will all become just the binary codes only. But with this trick, they will be able to stabilize the training a little bit more uh, because initially they will be able to have the guidance from the more informative real value embeddings. So uh, they can you know, have better um, representation power and also accuracy when shrinking the memory size. However, um, it is uh, a bit of a sad story for learning binary code because based upon our experience, we don't see many follow-up works uh, after 2020 or 2021. So there is actually a good reason for it, right? Because there are some properties, the negative parts of binary code that you can never avoid. So they are becoming less and less popular in the context of on-device recommender systems. Because the quick summary is here, the distinctiveness of individual binary codes doesn't necessarily translate to informative similarity score produced by this recommender system. So why, why is that the case? So here is one simple example, okay? We have one user and four different items and each of them has been assigned a binary code. And we can see they don't have any sparking. All codes are different, right? So it is good level of distinctiveness based on all the nice objectives we are chasing after. However, if we do some quick logical similarity calculation, so this one is normalized, right? If we have done this similarity calculation, we will quickly notice, okay, these four items, they are different and their codes are different. However, the resulted similarity score is the same, right? This is mainly due to the inherent nature of you know, using a logical operator. So these four different items, but they have same scores. So they will become undistinguishable for ranking purposes, right? Because all the essence of doing recommendation is to help users decide which is better than which. However, in the case of, you know, undistinguishable scores, how can you possibly determine which item is more suitable for the user, right? So the result is, you know, pretty bad, actually. The binary codes really have strong performance compromises. And even if you use a code length of 32, it is still no competitor compared with a real value 32 dimensional embedding. So it is getting less and less popular in the context of on-device recommendation. And this phenomenon also drives us to think about some other alternative solutions, right? Because we have already uncovered the bad aspects of using binary codes. So we are simply asking ourselves this question. So can we simply shift the back to real value embeddings, but we just make them lighter? Right. So how can we possibly make real value embeddings lighter? So suppose this is an N by D uh, dense embedding matrix. So N users and items and D dimensional embedding, right? And we can possibly do something like this, right? We can uh, transfer some of the useless values or less important values into zero. So this process is called zero masking or sparsification. So as a result, we will be getting a sparsified embedding matrix. We call that E prime. So still the same shape in terms of you know, matrix. All we want is to have the you know, uh, zero norm. So basically counting the number of non-zero entries in this matrix, we want that to be smaller than a threshold. We call that a sparsity threshold, okay? And for this one, because we are reducing the number of useful entries in this full dense embedding matrix, so we can still get a lighter embedding matrix as the result of it, right? So because the sparsified matrices can be efficiently stored. Uh, if you are using Python, you're using NumPy, you can use SciPy uh, sparse matrix. If you are operating with PyTorch or uh, TensorFlow, you can use sparse tensor for storage. 
both are pretty efficient compared with storing a full matrix. And in this case, only this sparsity threshold will matter. And then, because we have this sparsification, we are not changing the dimension, right? So each embedding still has the length of A. So there's no uh, modifications actually you will need to do for all the following computation steps. So you can still reuse all the components that is defined for this shape. So no change at all because of the consistent length. So that's a good property as well. And actually the star here, as you already have seen, is how can we do this zero masking step, right? Usually we define multiple ways. These are all trainable algorithms to perform this zero masking to make this thing lighter, but also performant at the same time. So let's quickly see, you know, some good ideas of doing the sparsification. So this is a very representative solution, the PEP. This is one of the papers published in the iClear 2021. So we have been, you know, closely following this research because it is very inspiring and useful to us as well. So basically, um, the conclusion is, you know, if we want to directly select T entries uh, to keep in the original embedding table and minimizing the recommendation loss at the same time, basically we are dealing with some combination optimization tasks, right? So you will quickly get into a place where you are solving MP hard problems. So not very ideal when we talk about efficiency. So can we simply uh, learn which entries to sparsify instead, right? Can we use a learning-based approach? And we definitely can. And probably the most straightforward solution to it would be reinforcement learning, right? So you draw some actions from the defined action space, you calculate the reward, and then you go over until you find a satisfying action for this. However, you know, still defining the action space is a bit challenging and finding a good, you know, action sampler, the policy network, it is uh, very, uh, you know, uh, challenging as well. And it can be very hard to train in practice. So we necessarily don't want to get into that space either. So what if we don't want to use reinforcement learning for this purpose? Well, we can resort to the trick of this one, reparameterization. So basically what we can do is to reformulate the pruning process using a differentiable process, all right? So V here is uh, the embedding table. Uh, and all we need here is a learnable threshold S that you input into this gating function. So basically G is sig mode. Uh, function, so you will be able to limit uh, the range of the output between zero and one. And the good point of this reparameterization trick is that, you know, if you get a very big score from the GS, it's going to drop out the corresponding entry in this uh, embedding table because of the effect of ReLU, right? Because if this is big, this becomes negative, and after ReLU, that will become zero and be zero mass. And then uh, basically this whole framework will be trained until this S achieves the desired sparsity. And once the sparsity is good enough, basically we keep the pruned embedding table and we just stop pruning and retrain the sparsified the recommender system. So we can ensure that the performance is quite optimal for this one. Okay, so that is the core idea behind the PEP. So let me talk about a slightly different approach. Okay, so this is actually a work proposed by our group uh, in uh, CIGA IR 2022. So it is called SSEDS. Basically, we are doing single shot embedding dimension search for on device recommendation tasks. The core question to be answered here is, because PEP still requires learning, right? There are some still learning objectives to be achieved. So can we possibly do all these embedding dimension search or uh, sparsification in one go, 
in single shot, right? This can be much quicker than PEP. So basically, this is our objective function. Uh, a slightly different formulation uh, with the previous one, but bearing the same intuition. We want uh, the sparsity to reach our desired level. And also the recommendation loss can be minimized at the same time. So all the formulation comes, to that, comes down to a core task of learning a binary mask over the embedding table, right? And then this task further comes down to learning the importance of each dimension, actually, in each embedding vector. So if we can figure out what is the importance of each number in an embedding vector, we can basically remove the less important ones and keep the important ones and then we can still preserve as much accuracy as we can possibly do for on the bias recommendation, right? So here it comes down to the actual formulation. So this epsilon ij basically is the importance score we define for each of the entries. So maybe i row and j column. So each entry in the embedding table. So this is something we would like to know and learn. We can quantify this by, you know, masking one place and calculate the change in the loss function. This is quite straightforward, but not particularly efficient, right? Because there are many, many entries in an embedding matrix for us to go through. So alternatively, with a bit of derivation, we can speed this process up with some continuous relaxation of this alpha, this mask. So with this one, if this is continuous, and we set this to an all one matrix, we will be able to calculate this approximated version in just one go. So pretty efficient. And what happens after we obtain all these score GIs for every entry in the embedding matrix? So how do we do the sparsification in practice? So basically, whenever we are given a specified sparse, a sparsity target, we will simply keep pruning the least important entries from the embedding table. So it can be determined by the magnitude of this resulted score. So basically smaller the magnitude of GIJ, the less important that entry is going to be for your recommendation accuracy. So we keep doing this until the embedding table meets the target sparsity level. And then we will use that as the final sparsified version for recommendation. So it has been a pretty, um, you know, um, prospective um, area to research on. However, it is still some distance from being a perfect solution. So let me quickly go through uh, when will things go wrong for the sparsification methods, okay? So this, is some statistics I have run uh, using uh, my computer. So if we assume there are um, 10, 100,000 users and items you need to store in your recommender system and also a dimension of 128 for embeddings, okay? So if this is the full embedding matrix, right? And you store that as a dense matrix. So this is what happens with NumPy dense storage around 100 megabytes. And if I prune out 75% of each dimension, so basically uh, I only keep one fourth of useful entries in this entire table, okay? And I store that with a pretty efficient SciPy sparse matrix, and I am getting a good amount of memory reduction, right? However, this reduction is not 75%, it's just around 50%. So why is that the case? I will talk about later, okay? And because one approach we have done is to get rid of, uh, you know, 75% uh, of the useful entries, why don't we directly use 25% of useful dimensions and define a dense embedding matrix, right? So basically the useful parameters in these two versions will be identical, right? So let's see what's the memory consumption if we do something like this. Actually, it's a bit of a surprise, right? So this one uses far less space than this one. So this is actually 
uh, a great reduction, approximating to 75% of reduction if we do this in a dense version. So a quick conclusion why this happens to the sparsified matrix is that whenever you store those sparse matrix, although there are some you know, more efficient data structures for you to do that, they will still need some extra parameters to handle all the indexing of zeros, right? Because they will need to keep tracing on where all the zero numbers are in order to recover this full matrix for follow-up computations. So there you have some additional storage costs. So definitely this version is not as good as this version using the M by D over four dense matrix storage. So this also leads us to ask this important question, right? So will this one be a viable solution to the sparsification dilemma, right? Sparsification, we know it is still not the best way to do compression. So will this dense version be the optimal solution? Well, let's try to discover further. So probably if we think in a very straightforward way, right? Can we simply shrink the embedding dimension for every user and item in the data set to some D prime, right? D prime should be way smaller than the original D. If we do this uniformly, right, this will be quite straightforward and easy to do. So originally we are using 128 as the embedding dimension. Now we just use 20. So great reduction. And everything is embedding into the same lens vector. So we can definitely ensure this this is great reduction, but is that the optimal solution? Well, I will introduce my intuition uh, here, okay? So if we still take items as an example, so we know that some items are naturally more popular in recommendation data sets, right? So if one item has many interactions, then it's going to be able to encode more useful information when its embedding is trained. So naturally we can claim more space, more embedding dimension for that specific item. So here comes my hypothesis, right? So each item should have different importance to the recommendation has. So we don't necessarily need to claim equal embedding dimensions for all the items uniformly, right? So they can have variations. So we relax the requirement a little from the naive solution I just introduced. So basically we can allow each item V's embedding size DV to vary. So they don't have to be the same. As long as one important criteria is met. So what's the criteria? We can result in this amount of total parameters, right? So we can set our ideal average embedding dimension. So what can be the total parameter allowed for us to use? As long as we can still do everything within this budget, then all good, right? So this will be a pictorial view of how the process looks like. Still, we are starting with an M by D dense embedding matrix. And then we simply resize the embedding dimension for every item in the data set. So this unused parts are no longer zeros in the full matrix they have been changed to a dense vector, but simply in smaller dimensions, right? Because they don't occupy, you know, uh, additional space with the useless zero entries. So they will naturally, you know, use less space. And in order to do that, this process usually will need some carefully designed embedding size search algorithms. And those size search algorithms are usually a subcategory of the AutoML algorithm. So AutoML stands for automated machine learning. And I will simply uh, focus on this part from now. So in order to achieve the process I just introduced, right, allow for different dimensions for every item you can possibly have in your data set. There is one early work called the um, auto embed, the automated embedding search proposed in 2021. 
So here is, you know, some resemble from the auto ML pipeline. So if we recall what is happening with the auto ML framework, we know the core idea of auto ML is to try different candidate neural networks, right? Or different structures. And then we simply pick the best performing one for every given task. And actually, there is a lot of similarity between auto embed and auto ML. So for auto embed, the difference is we are simply trying different candidates embedding sizes. Okay, the size is defined in a fixed set. So for example, in this paper, the authors are using two, eight, thirty-two, and sixty-four, and then we simply pick the best embedding dimension for every item we see in the data set. So there has been a lot of uh, discrete decisions to actually make, right? So in order to proceed with the optimization, if we view this as a discrete optimization problem, we can definitely use reinforcement learning, right? So basically the hard selection method. So choosing one at a time, calculate the reward. If not good enough, we go back and pick a different action. So this has been used in some other earlier work for reducing the memory size of embedding layers. And we can also define this problem in a differentiable way. So still very similar to the idea of calculating the importance of each possible option we have. And then all of these will become a bi-level optimization problem with a validation set. So Basically, the very famous differentiable search algorithm, the darts, can help us solve problems defined in this way. And usually, when we define this question, we need some objective functions, right? And for this one, it can use performance oriented objective function. You can simply use BPR, right, or any other self supervised loss functions. That's okay. And also, you can incorporate some size constraints, right? You can also penalize if the size of the resulting embedding is still too large for your allowed budget. So you can add as many as constraints as a differential loss function because we can use differential search for getting the optimal size. However, it is still not the optimal solution yet, okay? So I will simply try to point out to two possible directions for improving that variable size solution. So there are two notes I want to simply give for the previous embedding size search problem formulation. So the first thing is, for that formulation, what we will optim uh, optimally have is some uh, predefined search objectives, and we do some heavy computations. We do multiple rounds of searching, and then we only end up with one sparsified or you know uh, changed version of the embedding uh, matrix. So if you have this category-wise heterogeneity for all different devices, right? Because we are seeing more and more different apps equipped with recommendation capability, your phone, your smartwatch, your TV box, or even your internet router, they all can be equipped with on device recommender systems. However, they all have different capacity, right? They have different memory budgets allowed for your recommender system, even if they are designed for the same task. So if your phone has good capacity, then we search for a pretty big one. It won't necessarily fit into other devices. So if we simply pick the smallest device we can possibly find and search one for it, then all these uh, devices, when we de deploy the small model on it, it's actually wasting the amount of computation power we can use, right? Because we could have claimed the more memory space and have a more higher capacity recommendation model to use with higher accuracy. And also this kind of heterogeneity also happens if we see from the age perspective, right? So if you are using iPhone from the 2017, the iPhone age, 
only has two gigabytes of RAM. So probably if you do on device recommendation in 2017, probably your target would be this two gigabytes for the resulting size of your embedding. However, if we move on to 2020, right, you're allowed to use more computational power, six gigabytes. Would you still, you know, stick to the original old two gigabytes uh, memory budget? That wouldn't be very practical, right? If we're talking about maximizing the accuracy and performance. So this is one possible bottleneck for us to consider because we don't really want the one size fits all solution. That is not the optimal way of doing this, especially in the you know, research area that people are all talking about personalization. And the second thing is we still have this uh, huge performance bottleneck for variable size embeddings because as you see from the previous you know, predefined action space, Basically, we only are able to choose from, you know, a set of five or different possible embedding spaces. Not very ideal, like this one. It's simply too discrete. So it's actually shutting down our opportunities for searching for some fine-grained embedding sizes. What if the optimal embedding size is a number that sits between 32 and 64, right? We cannot achieve that with these coarse-grained search candidates. However, you know, if we think about using continuous search interval, like you know, one to 28, definitely we want that to be a natural number because we cannot have decimal points for embedding dimensions. It is definitely desirable, but we are adding huge costs if we are talking about searching or reinforcement learning because the action space will simply grow to a very large status. That can be very costly, right? So how can we possibly achieve this fine grain search, improve performance without putting too much computation in the process? So these are the two possible notes we want to improve on. And let's see how can we address these challenges further. So <clears throat> here is our solution to the first note. Okay, so we want the model, the search algorithm to be able to adapt to different memory budgets. Right, and with some efficiency guarantee. So these two work come from our group. So uh, one is from KDD 21, one the other is from TKDE 24. So basically, uh, this is how it works. We have a pre-trained full item embedding matrix, and all we need is to get some well-defined automated search function, which should be very efficient and requires no training as you go. And basically, the input to the search function would be the device, you know, computing capacity. And in our simplified setting, we only use the memory constraint or the memory budget. So you put different memory budgets in, it's going to search for the optimal version of the embedding table by keeping a part of it while meeting the memory constraint. And also, we should be able to uh, maximize the performance. And at the same time, we want to add on to the diversity of re uh, retained information because you know that will help us add the differentiability when we calculate the user item similarity scores, right? So this has been one important aspect I just mentioned earlier. And also based on this one, we also pr uh, proposed a plus version, basically. This one is just a uni universal version. So for whatever user, you only get one version of pruned or you know uh, simplified embedding matrix. But we can do that in a personalized way. So basically, for every single user in the data set, you will be able to get an optimally customized version, which is very lightweight and suits your memory budget. And this will help us further maximize the recommendation accuracy when we do personalized recommendation. So here, uh, I will then talk about how can we possibly improve on the second note I just mentioned. So how can we make the search space right for the variable embedding size more fine-grained 
almost like continuous search space without adding too much heavy computation and without challenging too much on the search algorithm, right? Because simply the search space will become very, very big if we do this continuously. So if we use reinforcement learning, we know, right, a big action space is definitely not very ideal for training any policy agents. So how can we do this? Actually, a very intuitive idea is we probably, right, when we decide that the action to take, we just use a more careful candidate exploration strategy. So instead of facing the entire and the very big action space every time, we just start with some promising points. We perform some random walks on some similar actions, and then that's it. We don't explore the whole space at each iteration. We just do the um, exploration gradually. And we also use this noise term here to encourage, okay, we can jump out of the box because of the noise every time we do the action sampling. So we can explore some unseen actions as we go. So this is also one of our proposed uh, solution uh, in CIR 2023. So this one, uh, we because we are using reinforcement learning on continuous variables, uh, we have adopted the twin delayed de deterministic policy gradient, TD3 for short, as the optimizer. So that part is not our contribution. So we are all about the exploration. And we use this to optimize this entire reinforcement learning based framework to search for fine grained embedding sizes for every item and user in the data set. So that's enough about you know, having variable sizes for the embeddings. And all we wanted to do with the variable sizes is actually to cure the sparsification dilemma, right? Because all the numbers, all the memory tests I have just done there, it indicates sparsification on a full embedding matrix is still not the ideal and optimal solution. And the variable size embeddings, that is a possible solution, number one. Now I'm going to talk about the possible solution number two. So basically that becomes a new category of the solution and it is called the compositional embedding methods. So what we have done earlier with the variable size embeddings is we're doing a lot of operations with this D, uh, the embedding dimension here, right? We actually haven't yet considered doing anything with this N here. So can we possibly reduce the number of embedding vectors we necessarily need to have, but still being able to represent all these n um, uh, users and items. So this should be uh, greater. So this sign should point in the other directions. So that's a uh, typo here. <clears throat> so how can we possibly do that, right? By doing something with this n here. The intuition for this one, is can we possibly, you know, for each V, still taking item as an example. So for each item, if we just pick two or more embeddings, and then we compose these two embeddings into one, right? So if we do any combination theory, right? Then if you have an N prime way smaller than N, the number of actual users and items in the data set, this amount of parameters can actually help us represent n prime choose two items, right? Still a huge amount of space saving. And then this idea is referred to as the compositional embedding methods. So here is the graphical view. So these two matrices, actually these are two code books. All we need to do is to find some predefined or learnable assignments. So every time we see an item, we know the code we should assign to it. And with this code, okay, index two, so we get this vector, index one, we get this vector from a different code book. So we get these two small codes and we use some composition ways, okay, can be concatenation, can be addition, can be element wise product, whatever your choice is. After the composition, we will be able to get 
this you know, unique vector representation for every item in the data set. And this is how we do it, the code books, right? And if we don't use one big chunk of the whole code book, if we have as smaller code books, okay, we can still do this as long as we make sure this equation will stand, right? Basically, the number of possible combinations will you know, be greater than the number of total users and items. Then we are all good to go. And then bearing this idea, the compositional embedding, here is a very, very classic way of doing this. This comes from a paper I published in KDD 2020. It is the quotient remainder trick or QRT in short. So basically <clears throat> it actually have uh, some similarities from the idea of dual hashing. Okay, so one hash function is the quotient computation. The other part will be the remainder computation. So this will give you some collision free formulation to hash each item ID into the K code book indexes. Okay, so we are using P1 all the way to PK if you have K code books. Okay, and interestingly, you know, the more exciting part would be the variation you can possibly have when you have all those indexes calculated by the hash function. So the authors have proposed the two variations. You can do linear composition, or you can instead use path-based composition. If you do the linear version, basically you will have multiple code books. And based on the code you generated for each item, you retrieve that small embedding, and then you combine them into one. So this W here is simply a combination function. And on the right-hand side, if you want to further reduce the space you can possibly use, you can consider this a path-based composition. So still we just have one code book. So after retrieving the corresponding code vector, we can do a sequence of nonlinear transformation based on different multi-layer perceptron heads, right? The way you combine this, uh, these different multi-layer perceptron heads will also change the final representation. So you can still manage to get different item embeddings that is unique to every item possible. So you don't have any collisions at all. So after this one has been proposed, <laughs> We have had some other follow-up works. So this one is published in CIR 2022. It's called the ultra compact the on device recommendation. So basically, if you know we recall some foundation knowledge from linear algebra, so if we recall matrix vectorization or SVD something, basically if you have a very big matrix, just like the embedding matrix we can basically decompose that big matrix into a sequence of matrix products, right? And in some more advanced versions, we can decompose that into a sequence of tensor products. That's possible to do as well. So bearing this intuition, right, we are calling back to the OD rack, our own proposed solution. So what we have used is a slightly more complex version of tensor products, the semi-tensor product, the STP as the solution. So the notation here looks something like this, but probably not the most important thing. All we need to know is, you know, it is still very similar to a sequence of matrix products, but you know, if you're familiar with PyTorch or TensorFlow, it actually applies some tiling before you do this product. So you can actually shear some parameters or it is more like, you know, doing matrix products uh, with the uh, broadcasting switch on, right? So you will simply need less parameters to do the product and recover everything into a very big matrix. So this is one toy example. So if you have a 12 by eight embedding table, and with STP, we will be able to shrink that into a sequence of tensor products or three tensors. 
So these are the smaller tensor shapes we will result after doing SCP. So you can see the amount of parameter deduction we have resulted here. And what's more special about this solution is, you know, there are some additional learning components to further enhance the accuracy despite the sparsity of the solution. So we have used the knowledge distillation from a full teacher model. And also we have done some contrastive learning on the smaller compact on device model in order to further preserve the performance and the accuracy. So, in all the previous methods, uh, we know basically if uh, you get some full embedding uh, matrices, uh, we basically have some predefined ways, right, of finding them. Uh, and then if we have some smaller tensors or smaller code books, all the two uh, previous methods I just mentioned have some predefined ways of formulating each unique embedding vector for each given item, right? But this actually motivates us to ask this important question. So is this predefined compositional assignment? So assignment basically is the way we decide the code, right? Uh, the location of the code books uh, for each given item. So is using predefined way the optimal way, right? Are there learnable versions of this? So we can basically adjust the compositional assignment adaptively based on the semantic context of user item similarities. So with this intuition, here comes our solution. So this is published in CIR 2024. What we have done is this is our code book, meta embedding, so E meta. And S is a trainable sparse assignment matrix. What we have done differently is to plug this into a GNN-based recommender. So we will be doing some composition encoding, and then we will be able to form the layer zero embedding for each item in the graph. And then we will be able to propagate it further using graph convolution, right? And after doing that, we simply use this similarity constraint, right? Because our intuition is if you can recover the full embedding layer zero, right, with this assignment matrix, this similarity should also hold when you have done all the convolution. And this similarity should also hold at the final layer as well. So this has become a very, very nice property for us especially in the context of learning assignments. Because if you have this equation, you can specifically solve this very quickly with a closed form solution, right? Because all you need to do is to calculate the matrix the inverse. Only one additional challenge is this is not a square matrix. So we have to use some sudo or more Penrose uh, matrix inverse instead as a workaround. But the good thing is, right, the code book can be learned end to end using gradients. But this one, the assignments, we can directly calculate this in close to form. So these two learning processes are interdependent from each other. So they don't necessarily interfere uh, with each other's performance. So this is very good. And we have also verified the good performance as well. Okay. <clears throat> So we have talked about variable size embedding and also compositional embeddings, right? So they do have some commonalities, right? They both come after I have introduced the, the problem of sparsification dilemma. And both variable size and composition embeddings are sound solutions to this dilemma here. But, you know, is there a definite comparison that which is better than which in all cases? Actually, no. Okay, so if you ask me the question when to use which solution, it really depends. So here is a quick summary of the pros and cons of each solution, the variable size embedding VSE and the compositional embedding CE. So basically, both of them will be able to achieve better memory efficiency than the embedding sparsification. 
right? Because you don't actually need to record the index of zero entries. So this is a plus for both. But if you know you want to have flexible embedding dimension based on importance, then VSE would be the only method that can do this. Because in CE, all dimensions are D-dimensional, okay? And then if you don't want to introduce any additional assignment storage, okay, you don't want some additional storage that is used for assigning the code books, right? Then VSE is also the solution that you can go with, not for CE, right? And then the additional benefit actually for CE, the compositional embedding is because all the embedding will share the same embedding dimension of D, right? We are only doing things with N here. We are not doing anything with D. So we have no need to modify the downstream similarity function, right? So if you have some MLPs or projection layers designed to handle a D dimensional vector, no changes are needed, but changes and dramatic ones will be needed for VSE because for each embedding, you actually are facing different dimensions. So you will need some smart workaround and more efforts will be needed for changing the downstream functions. And then the ability to handle new users uh, and items. Well, for variable size embeddings, it will be fairly challenging, right? So basically all the searches is done while all the items and users are synced. And for compositional embeddings, well, I put a question mark here because it will also require some special designs, some new thoughts into it. So if you can come up with some code to start encoding scheme, right, generate codes for new users and others based on, for example, site information, yeah, you should probably take this, right, and give this a green pass. But for other cases, well, I think more efforts will be needed to put when searching for a you know, viable solution. And then I will end my part with this one last page of slides. <clears throat> so it's all about the sustainable deployment, right? It is all about stay, keep your model, stay up to date for the new data address or distribution shifts or simply the change of user interest. Because in many cases, we don't want the deployment of on-device recommender system to just be a one-off process, right? After all the efforts, all the, all the computation you have done, this model can only handle data collected in a small time window. This is not very ideal, right? So in order to keep the on-device models up to date, a very, very popular way of doing this is called the patch learning. So that's a very solid choice in many scenarios. I will briefly talk about these two options here because this one actually has some overlap with the content that Liang will be introducing later because he will be talking about learning and updating. So on the left-hand side, you have model over model distillation. The way to do it is to simply learn some updates on the cloud and then distill it right, with some distillation loss, right? And then on the right-hand side, we have the communication efficient on-device model update or OD update. Basically, still learning the updates on a more capable device, for example, your cloud server, and then some compression will be needed, okay? After the compression is formed, basically, uh, looks like a zip file, but that's for model parameters, right? You send that to the model and it can append to the original model parameter. Then you have the updated model to handle new data shifts. So basically these are two promising ways of keep your model up to date if you want to leverage sustainable deployment for on-device recommended system. Okay, um, I think we have eaten you know, uh, 20 minutes into the coffee break. So apologies for that. So I think let's just to take 10 minutes break uh, and do the coffee break. And we will get back to the second half of this tutorial to talk about the remaining chapters uh, at 3.30, okay? So thank you everyone, see you later. So firstly, uh, welcome 
everyone back to the tutorial and also thanks for the Professor Hong Jin and Dr. Rocky's introduction to the earlier contents. And uh, in this section, I will introduce the remaining chapters, including the chapter four about the training and the updating for uh, ODRS, such as a fiber for learning, a fiber for recommendation system. And also in, in the chapter five, I will introduce uh, some of the uh, uh, security and the privacy concerns uh, about the uh, ODRS. And finally, we will discuss some limitations of the existing methods and also introduce some uh, future directions uh, followed by uh, open discussion and we can uh, have a QA section. Okay, uh, firstly, we will introduce the training and the updating for ODRS uh, because uh, Rocky has already introduced the deployment and the inference uh, of ODRS. However, uh, although the model uh, has already deployed on the devices, uh, however, the training process is still in the cloud, right? So the, if the training still in the cloud, it means that the users or the clients have to upload all of their privacy data, such as the user item interaction data to the server. So in this case, uh, we will have the privacy uh, concern. So this is the first motivation that is why we need to use the uh, 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 on-device training and updating. And uh, secondly, uh, because uh, as users interact with uh, uh, applications, uh, uh, they, they will continually generate the new uh, user in item interaction data. So if we use the, uh, uh, if we directly use the fiber to learning, so uh, we cannot obtain the real time, uh, the real time change in the user's privacy, uh, in the user's interest. So that's the second motivation that why do we need the uh, updating for the on device recommendation system. So to address these two problems, here we will int firstly introduce the uh, five data learning and the de decentralized learning methods for the uh, privacy concern to address the pr privacy concern. So the one nature solution to address this problem is to deploy the model on the user's own devices and train the local model based on the local data, right? However, as we know, the, di the distribution of the user's interaction data generally follows a long tail distribution, meaning that for each device, the number of the, the number of the training data is very limited. So we cannot, it is not enough for us to train uh, an accurate model to uh, to perform a good recommendation service. So uh, that is why we need to collaborative learning. The collaborative Collaborative learning could be two types of uh, methods. For the fiber learning methods, we uh, use a device to server communication, that is a device to server uh, collaborative learning. And for the decentralized methods, we uh, remove the reliance on the central server. Instead, we directly perform the device to device collaborative learning. That is uh, the, the first uh, two types of methods to try to uh, address the privacy concern. So uh, as mentioned earlier, we still have another uh, limitations of the traditional cloud-based methods as uh, how to capture the real-time interest uh, change for the, uh, for the users. So uh, lastly, we will introduce another type of uh, on-device recommendation model that is a uh, fine-tuning methods. So this is an overview of this section. Uh, and firstly, we will introduce the fiber to recommendation model. So the key idea of fiber to recommendation model is to maintain the user's privacy data on their own devices. So this is inspired by the uh, advancement, advancement of the fiber to learning in privacy uh, preserving machine learning tasks. So, uh, if we 
in 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 the context of biblical learning, so many studies have tried to incorporate the biblical learning in the recommendation task. So that that is what we call the biblical recommendation system. So the idea is that we take the user item interaction data on the user's devices, and in this way we can train. We also deploy a, a base traditional recommendation model also on the user's devices. In this way, uh, each device can train their own local model. And then we can upload this, the, the parameters or the gradients of this local model to the central server instead of the uh, raw data, the privacy data. So in this way, we can uh, protect the user's privacy. Okay. Uh, Next, I will introduce the typical pipelines of fiber to recommendation uh, methods. So the first step for the uh, fiber to recommendation system is client selection. So at the beginning, it means at the beginning, the central server uh, select a set of client based on the predefined uh, client selection strategies. So I will introduce the different client selection strategies uh, later. And also, once we have selected the client, the selected client can perform the traditional local training based on the local data. That's, uh, that's the second step, that's the local training. So uh, in the third step, after local training, we have got the updated uh, parameters for each device or the gradients for each device. In this way, we can upload this, this parameter this knowledge to the server instead of the raw data to the server. And finally, the server will collect this uploaded knowledge, uh, such as the parameters and the gradients, and then the central server will use a, a, mod, a, a model aggression algorithm, such as the final average, to learn a global model. Uh, to perform the final recommendation service and also to redistribute this global model to all devices for the next training round. So basically different fiber to recommendation methods will design different uh, uh, components uh, based on these four steps. Okay, uh, the, the first step is client selection, right? So here, uh, the, I will introduce uh, some popular methods in this type because we know the main purpose of the client selection is to choose a group of clients to participate in each round of training. However, why? Because the, since the client data is often, uh, is often non-independent and uh, undefinitely distributed, it means that uh, different users may have different uh, uh, data distribution, such as a feature distribution, such as a different uh, preference. So that is why we need to use uh, client selection strategy, because if we use different uh, uh, strategy, we can lead to different uh, model performance. So uh, for example, the uh, com model convergence speed, right? So uh, next, uh, I will introduce three uh, common use uh, Client strategy, uh, selection strategy. The first one is random selection. This is very common and easy uh, uh, client selection strategy because uh, as we know, in the context of recommendation, the number of clients is very large, such as every, uh, so the, the, each re client represent an uh, individual of the user, such as a smartphone, such as a laptop. So the number of uh, clients for the, in the context of file recommendation system is very large. In this way, we can only uh, choose a subset, a subset clients for each training round. That is why we use a random selection. So especially uh, we actually use a uniform sampling to sample a set of a, uh, clients for each training run. Another uh, method is a uh, full selection. However, uh, as I have mentioned before, the number of clients for the cross client federal recommendation system uh, is very large. So if we use a full selection for the cross client federal recommendation system, it 
for each training round, we have to wait a very, very long time until we collect all the uh, clients updating. So for the full selection, the, it, it's very suitable for the cross-platform federal recommendation system. So what is a cross-platform? Assume that in the in in generally for a uh, cross platform, the each client represent a company or a platform. We can give you an example. For example, in the metal in the metal company, he uh, this company has two platforms. The first one is Instagram, and another one is Facebook, right? And also we uh, we know we can there are many overlap users between these two platforms within the same group. Uh, within the same company. So in this case, we can employ the cross-platform federal recommendation methods to address uh, some uh, problems such as data sparsity. For example, if the uh, users in the Facebook had, had some uh, sparse uh, features, maybe we can leverage uh, the features in the Instagram to improve the performance of the uh, Facebook. And uh, this is the motivation of the Kyle's uh, platform and its suitable uh, scenarios. The last one is a clustering based selection method. So uh, actually for the above two methods we have mentioned uh, for the random selection and the full selection, both of these two types of methods are unbiased. That is the first one, uniform, uh, uniformly sample clients to participate in the training and the second one, select all the clients to participate in the training. Uh, so we, that, that is why we call it, uh, these two methods are unbiased. But for the clustering based methods, actually this is a biased selection methods because we, at the, at the beginning, we will group the individuals or the, group the uh, clients to the different groups. And then we will select uh, the clients based on the group clustering information. Okay, so uh, firstly, we will uh, in here we will introduce some uh, typical clustering-based selection methods uh, because we know the, the main issue with clustering-based uh, uh, client selection method is to how to determine the parameters used to group users. So as shown in this figure, we can see before we perform the client selection. The every, uh, every client need to upload some uh, inform parameters or some other uh, information to the server, and the server will cluster the will group this user based on their similarities to different uh, groups. So here, uh, different methods uh, generally use different uh, uh, clustering methods. For example. Uh, uh, an early work that is FedFast, which is published in 2020. And uh, the idea of this work is very uh, easy. And uh, it, the motivation of this work is to speed up the convergence speed of the FedFast uh, training process. So in this work, he, uh, it used the k-means for clustering um, by metadata, such as some uh, device information, device feature of the user's uh, metadata, and also the user embeddings. Based on the user embeddings, the server can cluster, uh, can group the user into different groups. This is the first type. And in the next type, the server can choose one client per group. So for the uh, later model aggression. So this is a uh, fast fast. So, uh, and the second work is a personalized uh, fast recommendation. So, this work is published in 2022 on CICAM conference. So, uh, basically, this work aim, aim to uh, extend the, the idea of fast fast by uh, choose the different number of clients for each group. So, he, uh, this work also used uh, uploaded embedding as a parameters for the purpose of clustering, but he chose uh, uh, proportionally uh, plants within each group. This is the first uh, two uh, clustering based methods. And uh, certainly another work uh, is a semi-decentralized uh, 
uh, fed the eco graph learning for recommendation. So for this work, uh, in the previous two works, actually we only use user embeddings for the clustering. However, for the third work, it considers both client and item embeddings uh, during the clustering. Uh, and I will, I will explain the reason behind uh, this, why this work will introduce uh, another uh, parameter that is item embedding later. And uh, then this work used the uh, fuzzy means to allow items to overlap different uh, uh, groups. So in this way, uh, he, he can, this work can perform the uh, standard part uh, uh, of learning. Okay, so after client selection, we, we, we have identified which clients will participate in uh, each round of fiber learning and uh, distributed the global model from the server, right? To, uh, but before we introduce uh, uh, local training here, I wanna introduce uh, two common use the framework. That is uh, the first one is neural collaborative learning, a uh, neural collaborative filtering NCF architecture. This is a very common used architecture in the recommendation uh, system. Uh, and also to, to ensure all audience uh, members are in the same page. So firstly, uh, especially those who might not be familiar with uh, uh, recommendation model. So here, firstly, I will briefly introduce a general idea, the key idea of the NCF uh, methods. So as shown in this figure, as shown in this figure, the, the goal of the NCF architecture is, is to calculate the similarity score for a given user and the items, because we know the, the, the goal of a recommendation system is to calculate the similarity score. In this case, we can uh, ranking the items to perform the recommendation service based on the ranking. So you can see the input, the input of, of NCF master is a user inviting and the item inviting that is a user inviting and the item inviting. So the NCF architecture consists of two components. The first one is on the left side, it's a uh, generalized uh, metric factorization side. So in the left side, we use the GMI. So you can see the input is a user inviting and the item inviting. And then we use the hard mod product to calculate the interact to calculate the dimension-wise interact vector uh, that is uh, here. And on the left, uh, 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 on the right part, we use a deep neural network to capture the nonlinear uh, relationships between users and uh, items. So you can see the input is the same as uh, the left side. It is also the user embedding and the item embedding. And then we will uh, feed these, these two embeddings to the hidden layer to get the final, uh, also the uh, interact uh, embedding vector. And finally, we can continue uh, these two embeddings to the final prediction layer. The prediction layer uh, generally is an MRP based on a layer. So the input is a continuation embedding and the output is a similar score. So this is the general idea of the NCR. And based on the NCF architecture, different uh, variants, uh, different federal recommendation methods may uh, apply different uh, uh, strategy to, to, to perform local training. For example, uh, for the FedMF, this is a very uh, early work. So he actually, this work is not DN based on method. This work is a, ma a metric factorization based on method because this work removes the DN part, uh, remove the DN uh, side on, in the NCF. So you can see from this figure, the, the input is user embedding and the item embedding. And he, uh, this work directly calculates the inner product to uh, get the final similarity score for a given uh, user, no, user embedding and item embedding. And how, how to perform the model upload, you can see the user embedding is still uh, updated uh, on the locally because generally user embedding still contains some privacy information. So uh, we generally keep the user embedding uh, strictly on the user's devices. 
and only the item embedding table is upload, upload, uh, uploaded to the central server for the later model aggregation. This is the idea of the FIT MI. And uh, another uh, following work is FIT NCF. This is uh, 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 actually it's a, a work to extend the FIT MF because it, the FIT NCF directly employs the uh, uh, the architecture of NCF. So you can see the, the input is also the user embedding and the item embedding, but if you use a score function, the score function is a MLP. So we can train the, both the user embedding, IP embedding, plus an additional uh, parameters in the MLP uh, in the score function. So in the model uploading process, the uh, user embedding is still keep it on the user's devices and only the item embedding table and the parameter in the score functions are uploaded to the server for the later uh, model aggregation. So this is the second work. Uh, lastly, uh, another typical work is, uh, is a personalized federal recommendation uh, uh, methods which published in uh, last year for in on um, uh, high conference. So this work is an um, uh, interesting work because we, this work argues uh, we actually we don't we, we don't need we don't need uh, uh, user embedding because he, uh, this work argues uh, item embedding has already contains the preference of a user, right? So in this work, he he uh, it only contains the item embedding and the score function for each local device and uh, he uh, it used the global model to train the personalized item embedding and the score functions. Okay, this is the uh, uh, three uh, typical work that which is which are based on the NCF architecture. Uh, another local training uh, uh, architecture is a GN based on my search because we know in recent, in, in recent years, graph neural network have achieved a, a very promising performance, uh, even the SOTA performance on the recommendation system. So uh, one natural idea is, uh, can we directly apply the graph neural network to the, uh, in, in the context of federal recommendation? So here, uh, I will firstly give you a, an explanation about why if we di directly use the federal graph neural network to the uh, federal graph neural network to the uh, federal, federal recommendation, the model actually the performance of the model will uh, decrease at the function. So you can see uh, as shown in this figure because the uh, privacy concern, each user have to keep their interaction data on their own devices. We can see for each user, the data is, is limited to the equal graphs, to the equal graphs. It's meaning that each user only has its first order items that he has interacted with, right? So in this way, the power of the uh, GN that capture the high order graph information cannot be directly used because we, we, we don't have the high order info graph structures information for uh, on each local device days. We only have the first order eco graph. That is why the performance of the GN based on my survey will, uh, uh, will decrease. So in summary, the, the reason is that the local data are limited to user central eco graph. This is the first order graph and that's a high order information graph uh, structure information cannot be directly uh, used leading to the decrease the model performance. So most, uh, most uh, GN based federal to recommendation methods try to answer this question. How can we leverage the high order graph structure information to improve the model performance? At the same time, we need to maintain the privacy. So, Actually, most of uh, GM-based methods uh, uh, try to address this technical challenge. Okay, firstly, uh, let me introduce the uh, pioneer work to 
address this prob uh, to address this problem. That is, uh, this work is published on uh, actually this work is published on Nature Communication uh, very top uh, journal in the machine in, in in the science. So the idea of this work is that. Uh, it's called, uh, the name of this work is 5GN, which published in 2022. So the key idea of this work is to use an additional third party server to construct a global graph. So in this way, in this way, the high order information could be used at the same time we still pr uh, pr uh, protect the users, how we say. So we can see at the first step, the users upload their uh, incorporate interaction data to the third party server, to the third party server. And uh, this third party server uh, must be uh, trusted. And the second step is to, is that the third party server construct a global model. And uh, in, in, in the second, in, in in the second style, is that the third party server construct a global model and uh, share the incorporate uh, anonymized neighbor information with the clients for local training. In this way, the, for each device, have, well, can access to the global uh, structure information, but, but the global instructor uh, graph structure information is uh, incorporated, is incorporated. So, the privacy of each uh, client has been uh, protected. And the lastly, that is the uh, incorporation process uh, introduced a significant uh, the computational and uh, communication cost. So this is a limitation of this work. So uh, another work is uh, uh, our work that we actually we have mentioned before in the class, uh, in the client selection a section that we mentioned that in uh, this work, uh, try to uh, clustering both clustering the users based on the both uh, uh, ecograph embedding and the item embedding. So in here, uh, we will answer the questions that why? Uh, because we know actually this work is a graph network based method. So as we know, uh, for each client, the, 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 the data is equal Graph meaning that it's a first order graph. So at the beginning, for this this work, try to learn a equal graph, equal graph uh, embedding, and then the equal graph embedding will be uploaded to the central server. So to the central server, and then the central server will use the equal graph embedding and the item embedding to perform the fuzzy C means. So in this way, in this way, items are grouped with with a user server will serve as a fake common neighbors. So we can see as here, uh, the, there are some fake common neighbors. Uh, actually it's a uh, item, in, uh, item embeddings. And in this way, users in each group can use the generate common neighbors as a bridge to transmit the user embedding. So in summary, this work try to clustering both the item embedding and the ecograph embedding in this way we can construct a sub uh, local high order graph for, uh, for within each uh, group. In this way, the, the fake common nodes uh, will serve as a bridge to transmit the user embedding and the high order graph information can be passed uh, over this sub, uh, sub local graph, uh, local high order graph. Uh, about two methods, actually, uh, the first, I actually introduced some uh, noise, right? Because uh, in, in the previous methods, actually here, he used a fake common node. However, the fake common node is generated by the model. So the quality of the fake common nodes will influence the model, the, the final model performance. So to address, uh, this problem, another um, uh, alternative approach is to utilize the real information. So where can we find some uh, set information to uh, help us to capture the high order graph information? So here, this work, 
uh, that is a five social net, a social recommendation with graph neural network. Uh, uh, my survey published uh, in a journal, uh, Toys. So this work uh, try to use uh, additional social information between users, that is a user to user connections. So in this way, we can see for each client, we can also have uh, a, a more higher, uh, uh, high, high order graph information, uh, that is a two order uh, user item to user or the user item uh, uh, and the, the user to user. So in this way, uh, this will collaborate uh, extra social information specifically for the user to user connections. So this can help uh, manimate the uh, data sparsity and the code start issues in the user item by pirate graph. Okay, so uh, above we have introduced uh, how to uh, perform the local training, how to perform the local training. So generally, we, we have two types of um, architecture. The first one is uh, NCF-based method. Uh, also, it's a metric factorization based on method and, and compare with uh, deep neural network. And the second, we introduce a graph neural network based on methods. Uh, different method try to address the limitation. It's like how to leverage a high order graph information at the same time. Uh, protect the user's privacy. So after the model parameters and the gradients are uh, uploaded to the server, the final step, the final step involves aggregating these uh, collected parameters to learn a global model. So here uh, we introduce three of uh, the most uh, common uh, methods used for this purpose. The first one, the first one uh, is a uh, very straightforward uh, gradient descent methods. So where the global models parameters are uh, updated directly based on the uploaded uh, gradients. So here you can see this is the sum of the gradients from the select uh, plans. So this is a very basic method. And uh, for the second method is a flat average. This method is very suitable for the uh, context of, of if we select, uh, we use a random selection plant selection strategy because, and uh, after the, the local training, each plant will upload the uh, updated parameters to the server and the, the server will use a weighted average uh, creation algorithms to learn the final global model as shown in this figure. And you can see the weights, the, the weights uh, in this creation function actually it depends on the, the size of the the, the, the number of training samples in each uh, class. So here you can see DU is the number of uh, data in in the uh, class, so the selected class, and the, the D the D uh, represents the number of the uh, the hotel the, the whole data set. So finally, it's an average aggregation. So the, this aggregation is similar with uh, better to average, but uh, it uh, consider all the class. Uh, as equal, so this is the aggression, uh, average aggression algorithms. Okay, so uh, uh, above we have introduced the general idea of the FIDOT learning, of the FIDOT, uh, FIDOT recommendation system. Although uh, FIDOT recommendation system can effectively uh, protect users privacy by keeping users' data on their own uh, local devices. As we have uh, previously discussed, uh, the, the, the currently federal recommendation system still largely uh, uh, rely on a central server. That is, uh, this architecture actually is a starship architecture with a star is a central server. So if we heavily rely on the, this uh, central server, the limitation is that we have the scalability issues. We also have the communication or, uh, overhead for the central server. So to address this problem, to address this problem, in this section, we will introduce the uh, decentralized methods. So as shown in this figure, the pipeline for decentralized methods uh, is similar to uh, that of federal recommendation methods. Uh, 
However, uh, that is with the data being retained on the user's local devices. However, the key idea for the decentralized recommendation method is it, 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 it reduces the rely on central server by uh, optimizing the model through the local chaining and the directly communication among uh, users. That is, we directly use device to device collaborative learning instead of the device to, send to server collaborative learning. However, the server, the function of the server in here is only for the, to assign the neighbors, to assign the neighbors for each target uh, device instead of the uh, uh, model aggregation. So this is the key idea of the decentralized uh, 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 federal recommendation, uh, the decentralized recommendation methods. So the question is that for the decentralized recommendation method, how to choose neighbors and how to do neighbors collaborative in learning? This is the two main questions for decentralized methods and the different existing methods uh, actually design different components to answer these two questions. Okay, first uh, uh, let, let's introduce uh, uh, a uh, decentralized uh, collaborative learning framework for next point of interest recommendation, uh, known as DCLR. So the key idea of this work uh, is focus on the POI recommendation, uh, offering suggestion like restaurant based on the use, user's past check-in records. So in this framework, each user uploads their uh, ge uh, geographical information and the categorical information. So uh, the geographical information actually is a location-based uh, uh, method because the task is a POI recommendation. So, so the location information uh, is very uh, important. And then another, what is this, uh, semantically uh, information, uh, semantically uh, information that is actually is a preference that has a, uh, the category of the restaurant, such as Asian, the Asian food, the Singapore food, the uh, Australian food. So that, that is what we call the cement, uh, cement information. So in this way, uh, in in this work, the neighbor selection strategy is uh, to uh, base is, is based on the geography information and the category uh, preference and the collaborate. Have learning is based on some uh, existing methods such as the Fed Average, such as Fed Average method. This is the first work. And another, uh, another decentralized recommendation method is um, model agnostic decentralized collaborative learning for on device POI recommendation. So in this work, it argued for the previous work that is uh, a DCLR. Uh, he, it, it argues that the DCR overlooked the heterogeneity, heterogeneity for different devices because different devices may have different storage, uh, different uh, uh, computation abilities and the different communication abilities. So if we deploy the same size model for all the class, which is suboptimal and it's hard to deploy it on to, to, to be deployed in the real world application. So for this work, the so Mike proposed a model agnostic decentralized collaborative learning for device with a heterogeneous model, especially for the different model size, the different model size. So let's see how, uh, what's the key idea of the, this work we can see. To address this issue, Mike introduced a, a model agnostic methods and the, the neighbor selection strategy is all uh, is still uh, based on the geographic information and the categorical preference. However, the difference lies in the collaborative learning because we have uh, mentioned that in in this work, in this work, different clients have the different uh, inviting sites. In this way, we cannot directly use private. Average. So to address this problem, this work proposed to use to the knowledge uh, destination to share the information, uh, share the knowledge among different uh, clients. For example, we you, you can see, so the first step is that we, we need to create a 
uh, reference site. The reference site is based on the, some public data. And uh, the, the only requirements for the reference site is, is that the reference site must contain all the category uh, information. So once we have the reference site, uh, every the target user and its neighbors will perform the local inference to get the uh, prediction results such as the logic. And the logic of the different plans can be shared among uh, the target user and its neighbor users. In this way, the different uh, uh, the target user and its neighbors can uh, share some uh, uh, knowledge uh, in a privacy preserving way. So this is the uh, architecture of the mic. Okay, so uh, about is a project recommendation system and the decentralized recommendation system. As we have mentioned, right, the motivation of these two types of methods is to address the privacy concern. And also actually we have another motivation of the uh, on-device training and updating, that is how to capture the uh, real-time change in the user's interest because uh, we, because the users uh, continually uh, interact with different applications, which meaning that they will generate the, con continually generate the new inter uh, interaction data. So how to capture the uh, real-time uh, interest the chains? If we, if we still follow this uh, cloud-based uh, architecture, that is uh, uh, the local device generates uh, the new uh, inter interaction data and uploads the data to the server, and the server collects this uh, data to, to update the model and return the, uh, to the user's devices. This is a very um, time-consuming process and uh, cannot capture the real-time change in users' uh, uh, the, the, the user's interest uh, changing. So to address this problem, the on-device recommendation fine tuning methods uh, have been explored to uh, reduce the training demand, that is, uh, learn the computational load to on individual devices compared to the full model training uh, in feather recommendation and the decentralized recommendation. And on the other hand, uh, this type of method can increase the user engagement uh, that is a short, a short, a shortening the training time, uh, potentially uh, increasing participation from less activity users. Okay, let's introduce uh, uh, two uh, typical methods. The first one is uh, belongs to the belongs to the whole model containing uh, category. That is uh, MPDA methods. So uh, the, the main challenge for the fine tuning is that uh, the size of the parameters is very large. And if we deploy the model on the user's devices and try to uh, fine tuning the model based on the local data, another uh, import, in, in another several limitation is that the number, the number of data on each device is limited. So it is not enough to train an accurate model to, uh, for, for, to capture the personalization uh, uh, preference for each uh, device. So to address this problem, this work tried to propose a domain adaption uh, methods that is, it will extract the similar data from the cloud and then use this similar data to augment the local data. In this, in this way, we can extend the size, the number of training data on the, uh, for, for each class. In this way, we can improve the performance of the fine tuning. So this is a, a general idea of the first work. And this work uh, is uh, published on the KDD in 2022. Okay. Another typical uh, my source is a uh, patch learning based uh, fine tuning my source. So as previously uh, we have introduced, uh, which requires an additional uh, patch model to uh, uh, additional patch model. So here we discuss the uh, representative work that is DCCL. So uh, this work actually is a device and uh, device and uh, central uh, cloud collaborative learning architecture. 
And the key idea is that it uses uh, uh, model over model definition. So we, as we know, the, the, the size of the uh, model in the center server is very large. So if we directly uh, definition de the uh, knowledge from the uh, cloud model to the uh, from the device model to the cloud model, it is very time consuming. So in this work, it proposed a metal metal path based uh, patch learning method. That is, he's, uh, this work select a set of uh, parameters as a, a metal path and uh, uh, as a, a, a complementary for the patch learning. And in this way, the cloud model will receive the destination uh, from number of uh, uh, many clients to improve the performance for the uh, device, uh, for, for the cloud model. So actually this architecture is focused on to you leverage uh, the knowledge of the device model to improve the performance of the cloud model. And then the, uh, the device, uh, the, the, the cloud model can improve the personality for each device model to improve the, uh, the, the more personalized the, uh, model recommendation. Okay, so in the previous, we have introduced uh, uh, three types of uh, training and updating methods, including the uh, fiber learning, decentralized learning, and uh, uh, fine tuning based on methods. So in the next chapter, we will introduce some uh, uh, security and privacy concern of these methods. So, the first, uh, it's a very uh, important question that why do we, why there still has some user privacy concern? Because uh, you may ask that they have already kept the user's data on their own devices. Why there still, uh, where there is still some concern, uh, privacy concern? So actually, many studies have explored the. Uh, this problem. For example, in FATGN, it uh, indicates that the a central server uh, with, uh, with its in, in QSTL intention can easily identify the retail items by uh, analysis the non zero gradients in the recommendation with uh, explicit feedback. And uh, another work is FATIMF. Uh, it also introduced that if we uh, Continually uh, uh, require uh, uh, if, if we uh, use uh, consecutive runs, we two consecutive runs, we can recover the user item interactions. So why? So uh, actually, the reason is, is like uh, the difference uh, scenarios between the uh, the aggression, the, the local training process between the. Uh, federal to learning in other areas and federal to learning in recommendation system. So you can see for the, the, the left uh, figure shows the architecture of the federal to learning in other uh, files, such as uh, computer vision. If we, we assume that the task is class, uh, image classification, so I generally we use a CN or DN as a base model. So in this case, if we perform the local training, Every base in the scene architecture will be updated, right? However, in the context of recommendation, the item embedding table dominates the main parameters. It means that only the only the embedding corresponding to the items that have interact with this user, only these embeddings will be updated. And the embeddings of the those Items that has not interact with the user, the the gradients of these embeddings will be zero. So that is why in the uh, in the fat gene it argues that we can analyze the non-zero gradients in recommendation to recover the user's interaction data. So to address this problem, actually we have some uh, uh, existing solutions. The first solution is. Uh, a solution from the perspective of the data. So the, uh, the a very na natural solution is to add some noise to the user item interaction or add some noise to the uh, gradients. So right. So for the explicit 
uh, feedback based uh, such as a rating, such as a rating from a user to uh, uh, item. We can add some uh, fake ratings. We can add some fake ratings. And for the implicit uh, feedback based uh, methods, we can add some uh, fake labels. So these two methods are basically my, uh, very common used methods. However, uh, these two methods will uh, in introduce additional noise, will uh, decrease, reduce the model performance because we introduce uh, uh, additional noise. So to address this problem, uh, the FedRack plus plus uh, try to address this problem by introducing and they the noise client that is as shown in this figure, we can see for the uh, ordinary class uh, after the local training, it will send a, a noise a noise greeting to the server. At the same time, this class will uh, send a clear clear, clear a noise to the denoting class. The denoting class are selected from the uh, all uh, available class. And then you can see for the denoising class, it will receive the noise uh, readings from the server and receive the uh, clear uh, readings from the ordinary class. In this way, we can train a uh, denoising uh, model to denote the uh, readings and return to the server. However, in the return process, we only return the sum of the readings instead of the, uh, the raw uh, gradients. In, in this way, the server cannot, uh, cannot know which uh, interaction, uh, the interaction data for us, us exactly users. So this is the idea uh, how to uh, animate the noise uh, influence. Another uh, solution is from the perspective from the model that here we introduce a uh, a uh, very, very common use of my search that is uh, use a uh, local uh, differential privacy that we call the RDP methods to uh, address the privacy concern. So for example, in the uh, work on uh, FedGN, in the FedGN, it uh, proposed to add noise data before it's sent to the server, such as a greeting. So the, the key idea is like in this formula, we can see the G represents uh, uh, uploaded gradients. So here we use a gradient clipping function to limit the magnitude of the gradients to a maximum value of delta. And uh, additionally, we also add uh, some Laplace noise to the clipped gradients uh, with parameters. So in this way, we can uh, balance uh, between the privacy uh, protection and the model accuracy. Uh, however, uh, all about methods are noise-based methods, as we have introduced that this, this, this type of method will re reduce the model performance because the introduction to additional noise. So uh, actually we have some basic uh, cl classical methods to address this problem here, that is in, uh, in cooperation-based uh, protection. So uh, this, my, this, this type of method try to address the privacy concern we, in a lossless manner. It means that uh, there is no uh, performance reduction. So how uh, the idea of this method is to use uh, incorporation uh, techniques. For example, uh, the very common use of uh, home faker incorporation. So it can enable the computational operations on incorporate data without the need for decorporation. However, the limitation of this kind of method is it requires significant uh, computational burden and uh, commuta communication uh, cost. And the second uh, commonly used technique is security multi-party um, computation. So you, you can see as a multiple clients and platforms to uh, jointly compute a function over the input uh, will keep the, those input private. However, uh, it's, uh, the limitation of this technique is also, it requires uh, the significant uh, commutation and uh, communication. So in summary, to privacy the, uh, to, to, to address the privacy concern, we have two types of methods. The first one is noise-based method, it will uh, reduce the model performance 
but with a large communication cost and uh, computation cost. And another type of method is uh, incorporation based methods. Uh, it will, uh, it is a loss less minor, but will uh, in increase uh, significant uh, uh, communication overhead and uh, computation overhead. Okay, so uh, in addition, uh, sorry. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. sorry. So uh, in, in addition to the privacy and the security risk, uh, risk for users, when actually when, when user can control the data and the model parameters uh, to communicate with the servers, the server side, the server side also faces a significant uh, uh, security risk. Uh, risks. So a, a common risk is uh, poisoning or attacking which involves uh, uh, inserting misleading or uh, malicious data into the system to manipulate the outcomes or degrees of model performance. So in the contents of uh, on-device recommendation uh, system here, we have two types of uh, uh, data poisoning uh, framework. The first one is the data poisoning in, uh, data poisoning in ODRS. Uh, the key idea is to attacker inject a fake interaction or uh, manip uh, manipulate the uh, existing data to promote or demote the products. And another is a model uh, model poisoning based methods that is directly controls uh, or revise the parameters or gradients uploaded to the uh, server. So uh, because uh, in the context of the file of learning, the the user, the, the users strictly keep the uh, keep the data on their own devices. So here we uh, mainly introduce model poisoning methods. So firstly, is uh, uh, an apparently uh, work that is a pipe attack. So this work aims to increase the exposed uh, ratio of a uh, target. Uh, the target item generally is an unpopular mm -hmm. item by uploading carefully uh, crafted gradients where a small number of uh, uh, manners the user doing the model up update process in fact of the learning. So the cool idea of this work is to uh, align the inviting of the target item with that of the popular items. But the popularity can be directly measured by the uh, uh, application data. For example, in the Taobao, actually we can uh, access to how many users bought uh, a certain item. And in this way, we can calculate the uh, popularity for all items. And the, the, the second, uh, the, the first condition for this work is that uh, it requires uh, attack can access the global model at any iteration. This is very reasonable because in the context of fiber learning, at each training run, the server will distribute the uh, global model to the clients, right? So for each client, we can access the global model. Uh, the, in this way, this connection could be uh, satisfied. And for the second, the, that is uh, the attacker can access uh, and alter all uh, malicious users' local data and uh, their gradients. Uh, this is also reasonable because uh, the uh, the clients can control their uh, own gradients, and also maybe he has uh, some uh, company uh, brands and to to do the same thing. And the lastly is uh, the attacker knows the whole atom side. So because the uh, the central server will send the atom inviting table to each client uh, in this way. The, Clients can know the, the whole item embedding table. That is why these three conditions uh, are reasonable for uh, attacking. And uh, besides uh, this, be besides this condition, this this work also try to uh, use uh, dis distance re regularization to uh, address uh, how to how to prevent the server to find the attacker. That is, uh, he. Uh, he tried to minimize the distance between the the, the uh, craft gradients and the original gradients. 
So uh, here we will also introduce to uh, some uh, another uh, work. The first one is uh, PSMU. So this work is uh, actually uh, published in the last year in Sega. And uh, the key idea of this work is to construct a, a managed user space random interaction and uh, promote the target items by improving their prediction uh, scores higher than the recommendation items and uh, uh, alternative items. And also this work proposed a defense, the defense strategy that is uh, HICS. You can see, so the idea of the defender is to use, uh, to use two stage of the uh, grading, the clapping and the specification uh, updating to uh, uh, deal with the effects of the points the gradings. And, uh, uh, okay, so, in the uh, fi fi finally, we will introduce some uh, uh, limitations of existing methods and uh, some uh, future direction. So uh, the first, the, the first uh, uh, limitation of the most existing on-device uh, recommended tra training methods is that they overlook the heterogeneity among devices because uh, because. It, in the real world, uh, different devices could have different, uh, uh, such, 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 such as uh, uh, the first one we call this uh, system heterogeneity. It means that different clients could have different storage and uh, computation and the communication capabilities, right? And the second, the second types of uh, heterogeneity we call that is a data heterogeneity. That is different. Uh, uh, users may have different preference. For example, for this gentleman, uh, he preferred to the movies, and for this lady, he preferred to the clothes. Right? So there's a third uh, heterogeneity we call it is a privacy heterogeneity. That maybe different users could have different uh, privacy budget. However, the most existing methods assume that all the users in the fiber to learning context uh, have the same zero, zero privacy budget. So maybe in, in, probably in the real world applications, some users are not, uh, are, are not concerned about their privacy. They, they, they are willing to upload their data to the server to obtain the better recommendation uh, uh, sort of device. And uh, also some users are, are only concerned partial uh, partial of their data and they, they are willing to upload a part of their data. So the, the, the third type of heterogeneity is privacy heterogeneity. And the next, uh, we will introduce some uh, exploration work to address this uh, uh, limitation. The, the first is uh, the work from our group. Uh, actually, this work is accepted by the SD conference this year and then uh, still not published uh, on, online, but we, you, you can find it on the archive. Uh, oh, so the idea of this work is, is that it considers the heterogeneous model size, heterogeneous model size, and it, it introduced a heterogeneous model aggregation strategy with uh, dual task learning and the dimension declaration uh, regularization to enable the efficient uh, knowledge sharing among different size models. So the, in this way, we, we can achieve the different uh, uh, heterogeneous model size. And the, the second work is that, uh, uh, a work that uh, try to address the different uh, privacy budget for different uh, uh, users. So you can see as shown in this figure, uh, the, the, the first user it actually is not concerned about its, its privacy. So, uh, the first user upload all of their its data to the central server, and the second user only uh, consider partial of their its data, and he uh, upload part of its data to the central server. So in this way, the central server actually can also construct a, 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 a data a global graph. However, this graph actually generally uh, it's not a, a connected while. So here in this work, it propose. Uh, a graph mining strategy to predict the missing links uh, among the uh, global graph. And in this way, we can uh, train the, the global graph as a server. And at the same time, we can train the uh, 
a local model based on local ecograph. And uh, after that, we use uh, it use a user centric, it use a constructive learning uh, from the, both the local view and the global view because uh, there are many overlapping uh, overlapped items between the local and uh, the central server. And the, the embedding of the local items uh, are served, served, served as a local view, and the embedding of the global uh, of the global server as a global view. And we can construct uh, positive pairs of nodes and the negative uh, pairs of the nodes. So, uh, the, the second limitation is uh, involving the user dynamic in ODRS. So. Uh, in the ODRS, actually, the, the number of users actually is involving with time. It means that it could be some new coming uh, use, users and uh, some uh, existing users. So the first uh, problem is a code start problem in ODRS. So it uh, generally introduced, uh, describe how to efficiently deploy a new model, uh, deploy a more effective model to new, newly added devices. Uh, this is a code start problem. And uh, the second problem is on learning for, for the existing users. That is how to uh, selectively forgetting the data from the users who are no longer uh, active in the system. Uh, actually, we have an uh, exploration uh, work in the, for, for the online, on, on, unlearning in the context of ODRS. But due to the time limitation, we, we, we don't introduce the details of this work. And uh, another uh, uh, limitation of the existing method is the model copyright uh, protection in ODRS, because we know actually uh, we, we pay more attention to protect, uh, to protect the user's privacy. However, in the, at the same time, the the privacy and the, the copyright of the of the company is still uh, in, in a very dangerous uh, si uh, situations because in ODRS recommend the most models are explored to, the, to all users because we deploy the item embedding table the, the model parameters to all clients so this will increase in the risk of IP uh, uh, set up. So to address this problem, uh, th this work uh, is a parameter transmission free uh, fiber to learning recommendation framework. So the key idea is that uh, we don't share any uh, model parameters. Instead of we only share the, some prediction or scores or a sub of set items. Uh, in this way, we can balance the protection of both client's data privacy and uh, the service uh, provider model's privacy. Okay, uh, finally, it's about the fun, fun, foundation model in ODRS because we know uh, foundation model or the last language model is a very hot topic and uh, actually has achieved some promising results in the recommendation uh, task. However, most existing foundation model based methods are cloud based methods. Uh, that is, uh, the, it overlooks the privacy and the lightweighting. Uh, uh, requirements. For example, if we want to uh, get a tra 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 travel recommendation, we need to upload our schedule to the cloud server. This, this will uh, significantly uh, po pose a risk to our privacy. To privacy. So, so the future direction here is how to uh, compress the model, such as the model light weighting and uh, also to improve the privacy con consideration. Uh, this is uh, still an open question and uh, we didn't find uh, some uh, exploration works. Uh, okay, in the finally, so here uh, we have introduced uh, the training and the security and uh, uh, some limitations. So finally, uh, because of the time limitation, we cannot introduce every detail of these methods. So if you want, want to get more information and uh, want to uh, get more details of these methods, uh, welcome to uh, refer to our comp comprehensive survey. Uh, and this is a link of the archive. And also uh, we, we have uh, uh, 
special issue on a very top top level journal like the Science China Information Science, uh, which is a CCFA uh, a journal. So in CCF, so we have a, a special issue. And uh, if, if you have some works about uh, the on direct recommendation, welcome to submit uh, your work to, to, to do this special issue. Okay, uh, finally, is uh, the Q&A uh, session. So if you have any question, uh, uh, we will try to address this. Yeah, um, please join me in thanking uh, Leo for presenting the second half of the scenario. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so now we do have some uh, minutes to spare. So if you have a burning question to ask, you can uh, raise your hand and I'll hand over the microphone to you so we can have some uh, extended discussions. Any questions about that? Not limited you to the technical presentation. Uh, so there are some kind of questions. So, um, if you, if you you know want to discuss all further directions uh, about this line of research, yeah, you are simply welcome to join the discussion as well. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering um, how you uh, uh, thought about the, how to detect the um, data poisoning in um, uh, how to detect the data poisoning. You have mentioned a lot of uh, uh, data poisoning uh, uh, attack. <coughs> Uh, that's how you uh, discovered the method to detect them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, thanks, thanks for your question. Actually, this is a very good question. And uh, actually, uh, uh, the, the, the attacker detecting actually is very uh, important mm -hmm. and uh, also is a very hard, hard problem. So. Uh, actually, for for the each uh, poisoning papers, actually it will introduce some defender strategies, such as in this work, it introduced uh, uh, a defender called HSS to to use some uh, a, a strategy to 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 define the poison, but uh, they detect the uh, attacker. I, I think it is still and a challenging uh, question, but we we can try to some solutions to. Uh, uh, it reduced the influence from the uh, attacker. Okay, so that's, uh, kind of noise or some superficial yeah. 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 So, uh, you mean the the defense strategy? Yeah. I mean, um, there are uh, some strategies that not action. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Uh, I think at this moment, probably I do have uh, a quick question for for now, yeah, because I know you have been working on you know uh, security and privacy on particular systems for a very long time. Probably you know better uh, than, than I do in this case. So we're seeing more and more large language model based recommender systems, right? So in your view, are these recommend assistance more robust to uh, attacks, or they actually are more prone to attacks? Uh, okay, <laughs> this is a very good question. Thank you. So in, in my uh, view, so I, I think it's uh, this large language model based on method actually it's more ro robust uh, than the traditional uh, method because. Uh, Actually, it depends. What, what's the, what, what's your tra training data? Do do you need the uh, uh, because uh, the large language model is generally uh, trained on the cloud server because it requires many uh, computational sources. So, uh, I, I I we cannot directly. 
deploy this large language model on the devices. So I think maybe the users don't have better chance to upload their data and their parameters to the cloud. So. Mm -hmm. Are you going to convert you know, the large language model based regulatory system to another device setting, but in a different way? Probably we just, you know, on the device, we use some very lightweight methods to probably generate uh, user prompts, right? So instead of uh, you know, requesting some recommendations, we can send prompts to essentially control the regulatory system based on our own map, and then we can. Get some results return to Java or get some initial recall and item list, and then we can do re ranking on the bus. Yeah, and one specific thing uh, I have noticed before attacking Java is actually you can modify the prompt. Oh, and yeah, that, that will change the, the, the result uh, dramatically. And some people will even, you know, insert a special token into the prompt, and that will also have devastating effects uh, on the you know, response generated by our uh, hand. Yes. So I think that will still be an open ended, ended question. Yeah, it's a very yeah. good point. So do you have any follow up questions um, for today's tutorial? Yeah, um, I think, yeah, so if you know there are no uh, follow up questions, or if your preference is to simply discuss offline uh, in person, yeah, we can probably. Yeah. Okay, I'll just send a file copy. I have one question uh, about the on device recommendation. Now, there's a large language model uh, and in most of the situations, uh, seems. Uh, need to be run in the cloud. And uh, in most of the situations, uh, in terms of drivers available, uh, and the mobile phone is uh, necessary and uh, all in most of the situations. I wanted to know how to make a better check off uh, about the technique of the drivers available, uh, information protection. Uh, this is my question. Thank you for your question. Uh, That's a very good question. Um, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, there are, I think it's, this question is very significant, not only in academic, but also in industry. I talked I talk with the VP from Tanjun, Mr. Jiangjia, uh, two weeks ago. They also tried to solve such kind of problem. Um, first, uh, Generally, how to make such kind of balance? Uh, of course, in some situation, we want to deploy the large language model onto our small device. The dilemma is that the large language model is very, very big, but all the memory in our device are very, very small. So, uh, I think most of uh, the uh, large language, uh, large language model companies, such as uh, 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 Google, uh, maybe Apple, and uh, uh, Meta. So I think they are also working on small large language model. One billion, such as one billion. I think one uh, large, large language model with one billion parameter can be deployed on device now. Uh, um, but Maybe the performance is not so good. Performance is not so good. Uh, their uh, method is just to uh, construct uh, a not a so large scale data set, but with a high quality. With a high quality. So uh, the, the real challenge is how to construct such high quality data set. The data set is not, uh, not large. Uh, it's small, but it's high quality. Uh, that's why it's called less is more. Less is more. And uh, this is the one direction we can construct a, a, a not so large security set, but with high quality. The second is uh, uh, based on the uh, 
even if I can do it for the uh, line level model with the one, one billion parameter, it's also very big for a small device. We can make it uh, uh, smaller. Uh, how to do it? Actually, I think uh, personalization uh, is a good way. Because you know, large language model is proposed or is deployed, uh, it's deployed for all the people. Anyone can use it. It has to meet the requirement, the demand of all the users. So we actually we cannot make it very, very small. Because different users have different reference, different users have different demand, right? But when we deploy in the large language model on our device, we don't need to meet the requirement of all of the users. We only need to meet your demand, your preference, your need. So that's why that, I think we don't need to make uh, make uh, just make your head, just make your head, right? So, but your interest, your preference, your demand are quite limited. So now uh, we have an opportunity to make it much smaller and they can only uh, meet your requirement. So it's possible, it's quite possible. And then another question is uh, how to, uh, uh, that's back to your question. Uh, of course, when we deploy the line language model on the we can protect, better protect our privacy. And uh, based on the personalization, we can achieve good performance. Of course, the good performance is for you. It's only for you. And sometimes uh, you know, when your preference, when your interest uh, shift, at, at this moment, the undeveloped large language model cannot work well. So uh, to address such kind of problem, we propose the device and the cloud collaboration. In other words, we deploy a small model on your device if you have a large model on the edge or on the cloud, uh, when the on device large language model uh, generate a response to your query, we not only generate the result, we also calculate the confidence. When the confidence of the on device RM is not very high, is lower than a threshold, we will forward your request, your prompt to the IRM on the cloud. That's why we call it uh, device cloud, maybe device and cloud collaboration. Okay, so any other further questions for today? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah, sure. Yes, I want to know how to evaluate the quality of the data. Set. Uh, That's a good question. I think it's like a million, one million dollar question. How to evaluate <laughs> the quality of the data set? Uh, I think the first, uh, the highest quality data set should be textbook. Should be textbook. So when you train a live level model and uh, the size of the training data set is, uh, if you have the the the, the, the internet or the content that has the data set cannot be uh, very large in this setting, first choice collect all the textbook data because it has the highest quality. And uh, of course, Wikipedia page are also very high, high quality. The quality is only one factor we need to consider. Another factor we need to consider is diversity. Yeah, I think uh, you can refer to some publication uh, 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 data set for like a new model. I think there's some discussion about how to uh, select the data for training like language. I think I can add one more point to you know, how can we measure or how to use the quality of data points. I think quality is also a um, subjective term based on your real demand. 
you know, the rate requirements. So, for example, in the very classic machine learning, right? So, if we are simply for the you know, recognition from the n minus the data set, so if they don't really have a lot of budget to collect the, uh, all the training samples, probably a good way is to only keep those very representative images, right? The, the very uh, clear ones uh, without any ambiguity. So by training on this small amount of good images, you will be able to get a fairly good model in terms of accuracy. However, when you are able to increase the budget or your data samples a little bit, right? It is always good to have higher diversity or the data points you have seen because the general liability of a machine learning model is something we also care about when doing you know, practical implementations. So diversity matters, right? It can generalize well. Um, and those will be more about more than medium budget for your data set size. And then if you can go really big with the data points you can collect, it is even better if you can have some natural noise, right? White noise in your data samples, because it can further add onto the robustness of the algorithm you are training, right? It will be a kind of natural way of uh, doing data organization. So that really depends on a lot of scenarios, right? So if you have very limited budgets, Probably high quality data is just the, those representative, the core set of the you know data samples. If you have medium budget, maybe consider adding more diversity. If you really really have good amount of data points you can sample, right? You have really strong budgets. Probably you know also consider doing augmentations or adding a little bit random noise, so you can enhance the general reliability and robustness of your model. It really depends. Um, yeah, so do we, do we have uh, any other questions? Um, if, if no, we can probably just uh, end today's tutorial, yeah, and, and we can probably continue all these kind of discussions offline. All good? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending.